Hello, how are you doing today? Welcome new subscribers. Thank you subscribers for following and sharing our videos. We appreciate you. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button right now. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Today, I wanted to do a book review on Summoning Spirits. I talked a little bit about it in another video. I can't remember what video it was. But the reason, and I've had this link for a while, this free ebook link that I'm going to leave here with you so you don't even have to purchase the book or look for it. You're going to be able to read this for free. But I thought I would come here and do a book review on it to make sure you use the book responsibly because uh, it should be handled with care because what you're dealing with is very serious. Uh, I had a subscriber to bring it to my attention because I mentioned the book and how much success I had in working with the book. And I wanted to come here and let you know that this is a book that helps you evoke a inner uh, uh, entity onto the physical realm versus invoking an entity where you are going to the astral mental plane communicating with these entities and evoking you are evoking them here on your physical plane and you are having contact with them so you on in your space so you want to be very careful about that there is some things are there some things in this book that you can use and you know use at your own discretion you don't have to use every single thing in this book not unless you're going to be working with these entities then I do advise uh, that but it's great for helping you open up your astral uh, senses it's really great for that if you're trying to open up your psychic abilities and things like that this book is excellent for that because it certainly helps you do that so uh what else i wanted to talk about i want to talk the book has 10 chapters in it it's 204 pages i'm going to read the the summary here for you in the back in the back of the book, the name of this author is Costinos. And please bear with me in this book because it's electronic, so it's hard to get the pages just right so I can give a, book, a really good book review on it for you. And I, I'm going to probably keep you here for a little minute because I want to make sure that I am responsibly educating you on the book before you start reading. I know it's free and you're going to see it yourself. But I also wanted to give you the opportunity to say whether or not you wanted to work with this either. Like I said, this is a big responsibility if you're going to be evoking spirits. This is a brand new game changer. All right. And I don't uh, I don't I don't advise you to do it alone. This is something that should be worked within a group and not as an individual, at least with somebody who's more experienced. So I do recommend that. And I think he recommends that in this book. But like I said, this book is very good for opening up your clairvoyance and your clairaudience too. And making sure you're mental, because all of this is consciousness, making sure you are mentally healthy too when you're working with this type of magic. is It, it plays a major factor in working with this. All right, like like I said, everything is consciousness, and you'll understand more about that as I get into this book review. All right, evoking spirits is one of the most powerful magical techniques you can use, but until now, most of the material available on ev evocation has been virtually unusable since it was written by those with little practical evocation experience. This book was written by the practicing magician who has successfully performed many evocations. With his guidance and clear direction, performing evocations will be easy for anyone, and it is. My experience is I went to the astral plane. I didn't know the astral plane was that close. Like I was very young. This was 20 years ago. I turned off the light did you know his exercises are so simple and they they slowly open up your astral senses and you you actually experience them opening when you go when you work this book and I turned off the light and I I saw all these astral entities I was in the astral world I was traveling in this space this mental space and it just, I, it worked so well. It kind of scared me and I turned off, I turned on the light. 
and I didn't know the astral world was just that you know close to us. It was a, it was a great experience, but I didn't think it was going to work, and that's why I kept going and going. So if you do follow everything verbatim in this book, it's going to work. There is no doubt about it. If you follow it just the way he tells you to follow it, you're going to have success. Summoning Spirits is a complete manual for evoking entities to affect miraculous changes in your life. Learn how the spirits that dwell on the other planes can be evoked to the astral and physical planes to help you obtain mystical abilities, locate hidden treasures, even command the spirit armor to protect your home while you're away. This book name, names and describes the specific attributes of and abilities of 50 entities whom you can evoke to uncover valuable knowledge and who will help you succeed in nearly any task, magical or mundane. Learn how to safely evoke spirits for any task. Create and charge. I think that's what this is. Cause see, I'm having to navigate this book. Yeah. To aid you with any task, create seagulls, charge with the energy of the spirits to magnify your work. So I just went beyond I just went beyond that because this book, you know, these electronic books, they act crazy. Okay. Uh magical, make uh those little uh voodoo dolls, because that's what an ingregory is. That is a uh like a Jewish word for a voodoo doll, so to speak. In Gregory, a manufactured spirit that will perform the task of your choice. Perform, perform any exercises to train your magical abilities to develop clairvoyance and clairaudience. Construct and prepare and use magical tools to aid in your evocation. So he does teach you all of that. I'm going to start on page 17 doing a, a review on this book. I might keep you a little here along because I want you to understand what you're getting yourself into and understand that you're going to be working with entities. So if you're in interested in mediumship or something like that, this is an excellent book for that. But I do warn you, you will you will see and hear entities on on your physical realm. This is nothing you'll be using your astral senses for, your sixth sense you know, your intuition. This is usually how we communicate with spirits. But when you start communicating with, with spirits like this on your physical plane, this is where it comes really dangerous. And if people are not mentally stable, uh, you can have a mental breakdown. So make sure that you are mentally stable before you get yourself into something like this. All right. So I have to warn people, you know, uh, you think you want to do something like this and then when you do get into it you know uh and i'm starting on page 17. coming down too much uh i'm starting on page 17. and excuse me if i have to pause because this is an electronic book so you know how you have to navigate where you can read it just right, especially when I'm reading it in Google Drive. So you'll see what I'm talking about once you start reading the book, because uh, I'm reading it on my laptop right now. I got like two laptops up, and I'm reading it on my old laptop. Uh, the word entity, and this is page 17, first chapter. Uh, I, I'm not going over the introduction because it's more about himself, and it's not really that much about the book. I feel like the first chapter really gives you more of the book all right but you're going to have the book is free for you so you'll be able to sit yourself the word entity has been mentioned several times in the introduction and rightly so because the whole point of the perform of performing an evocation is to come in contact with one of the these beings but what are entities really and where do they come from when called without an understanding of the nature of entities it is incredibly difficult to perform an evocation and virtually impossible to control the outcome of one. It is for this reason the chapter is devoted to explaining the inhabitants of the unseen world. However, like many other occult truths, the nature of entities has been explained both correctly and incorrectly over the years. To understand why this is so, it is important to first understand who are 
who originated these theories. Throughout the ages, there have always been two kinds of occultists, armchair theorists and practicing magicians. The former have, in the past century, attempted to explain the occult phenomena using the science of the time, neglecting the fact that the occult science is a science of, fu of the future. As a result of the efforts of the armchair occultists, all sorts of psychological theories about magic have surfaced. The concepts are hopelessly flawed as their creators were basically guessing about the topic they didn't understand. Practicing magicians, on the other hand, have experimented with the magical techniques and achieved repeatable results. These tested theories are the ones the students of the occult will find most useful. The theory that entities only exist in the magician's mind originated with the armchair occultists of the hit of history. According to them, evocations do nothing but bring the entities, entities up from one subconscious and out into the seemingly external appearance. Followers of this teaching feel all information gained by the evocation is the result of some type of telepathy and the materialization materializations witnessed by a number of practitioners are the result of some type of telepathic projection on the part of the magician performing the ritual. To someone who has never practiced magic, this concept could seem feasible, but to a trained magician, the flaws of this theory are immediately obvious for the number of reasons. In philosophy, there are two concepts known as efficient cause and the final cause. The efficient cause of an object is that which caused it to originate. The final cause is the, is the purpose of the object. Upon applying these principles to mystical study, a great number of occult secrets can be learned. Practicing magicians realize this and use these ideas as a basis of their experiments trying to identify what entities are. The efficient cause of everything in the universe is God the infinite and the divine providence. Of course, it can be argued that we ourselves have created magnificent things. Here we go again, I can't see nothing. And that certain natural processes create things all around us. For example, plants and animals produce tech Tectonic plate movements creates mountains, and artists paint masterpieces. But divine, but divine guidance affects all, all these things. The inspiration for a painted masterpiece comes from God, as does the ability for plants and animals to reproduce and mountains to form. It is accepted that divine providence is possible for all creation. Then the next logical step is to try and figure out what certain things were created for. The best way to facil facilitate this is to look at the Kabbalistic map of creation, the tree of life. Each ten separate or spheres on the tree serves as a specific purpose in maintaining cosmic order and as a result each are made up of different types of energies related to their tasks. For example, the energies of the lower sephra, Malkut, help maintain order in the physical plane, while Yesod governs things related to lunar energies and the astral plane. Just as the Sifri were created to serve a specific purpose, the entities of the universe were created to fulfill some type of office. Each of the Sifris, for example, is inhabited by beings that are in agreement with the energies represented there. The angels were created to oversee certain, certain of these aspects, and for this reason, they will maintain these posts forever, while humans have the ability to advance spiritually and achieve higher and higher levels of being. The entities and angels of the universe are fixed to their position. As a part of God's way of maintaining order in the cosmos, this is the final cause of all entities. How could entities exist only in the mind of the magician if we accept Except the above is true. The answer is simple. They can't. Neither the existence of the universe nor the existence of the inhabitants depends on the presence of one human. However, Ashley 
actually wrote that Goetia is no longer living, yet the beings. Let me go up a little bit. Ah, did it again. I'm so sorry, you guys. I'm so sorry. This is what I did when I'm messing with this electronic stuff. It's, it's, it sucks. Let me get back to the page real quick, so please bear with me. However, the answer is simple. They can't neither. The existence of the universe nor the existence of the habit depends on the presence of one human. Whoever actually wrote the Goetia is no longer living, yet the beings described in the book can be conjured. It's this conjured. It's that hoodoo. You know what I'm saying? And they do this with the saints, too. You can do this with the saints. But again, you're not evoking them. This You're actually personally working with these spirits on a... Wow. One on one basis, like you get to see them. The spirits he or she worked with still exist independent of him or her. By now, it should be clear that the beings of the unseen world are not accidental creations. They are created with specific attributes to help them accomplish their assigned tasks and exist completely indep independent of us. However, just as some forms of physical crea creation are accomplished through human mediums, the creation of entities is sometimes facilitated by trained magicians. Like a painter who takes a divine inspiration and creates a, a marvel on a canvas, a magician can sometimes channel divine energy into the, create, into the creation of a completely new entity. Mm. The, mag the ma magical construct commonly known as uh, an Gregory is an energy being created by the magician to create out of specific tasks. And Gregory's, like other entities, are completely independent of the magicians once created. Okay, now I get that now. Okay, now I get that. Because he taking, you're taking your, when you take it, use it like a sugar doll. If you've heard those in hoodoo, you, you're taking your energy and putting it into that doll and working with it. So that's that's kind of what these little dolls, you heard about these little healing dolls, these dolls that you can work with to help focus uh, your work, your condition work. I hate calling it magic, but, you know, it's, it's really a science of consciousness. That's what I like to uh, call it. Whether the entity is, it, is created or conjured, the fact, it, the fact it is independent of us. Does not mean we are not responsible for its action. If one were to command a being of any type to perform an evil act, then he or she would be responsible for the karma of that evil act. It goes without saying that this type of black magic will eventually destroy the person who practices it. So it can be used for, you know, I hate he went out into that, but it can be used for, uh, you know, bad things as well. But for most part, uh, most people use that for healing. And so he goes on to talking about a, the golem, cause a golem is nothing but like a, a voodoo doll. Okay, that's that's all that a golem is. So he goes into talking to boy about that. I want to skip that. And so he goes more about how to create those in those book. If you're interested in in trying to create one of those, he really tells you how to put the spirit in the doll and get it to work. Uh, and you know they use a lot of this magic stuff in hoodoo. You know, uh, they do use a lot of this Jewish, Jewish, because uh, you got to remember they get, they're getting a lot of this stuff from the ancient world. A lot of this stuff has been recycled from the ancient world. And so a lot of it is authentic when you know how to use it. And now he talks about types of entities. Uh, and this is page 21. I thought this was worth mentioning. Uh there is a lot of good entities in here, but the goetic entities are kind of iffy because they can get, you have to be 
very authoritative if you're going to be working with the go-edit spirit and really choose the right one you want to work with. But there's some really good entities in here to work with, though. We have seen how entities could originate in the mind of humans and how they only exist independent of them. While the purpose of the ingrigory, ingrigory, I hope I'm pronouncing it right because y'all know I'm the, like the worst at pronoun uh, pronouncing things is determined by the magician. The purpose of the other entities in the universe has to be discovered. And Gregory's dealt with, deal with the first because they are relatively easy to understand. The nature of the pre-existing entities is a little more complex. I don't know why he used that as, a, um, as an ex example. I don't know why he used the the voodoo dollars example. I just I don't know that that's just not connecting with me. I don't know why that's not connecting. However, because there are so many different types of of them to learn about. By way of intro, introduction, following is a list of some of the types of entities found in the universe. So he goes on to talk about planetary entities. These are some of the easiest entities to work with. Each of these beings represent the magical astrological aspects of planet and can use these forces to aid the magician. For example, a spirit from Venus sphere would be helpful to a magician needed advice in matters concerning love, friendship, while Mars is good for intelligence. Planetary intelligence are Intelligence are very powerful and can help the magician in a number of related tasks simultaneously. The attributes of each of these planet planets intelligences closely correspond to the specific cipher of the tree of life therefore to avoid repetition i will be exploring the powers of the inhabitants of the cipher and the planets in the following description of the angels and then he talks about the angelic beings these entities are without a doubt the most beneficial ones a magician can work with they are more than willing to help a magician with a task they are proficient with with an and answer truthfully to any question. Put forth, put forth them without hesitation. Angels are assigned to certain tasks by God when they were created, and unlike us, can never advance from their current spiritual level of development. So, and that's the first thing I've, I've worked with them for a while now. I'm working with an ancestors. I've never worked with the planetarians before but my ancestors let me know the other night, day um uh, in a reading that i might be perhaps working with those type of entities these so-called you know some people call them aliens i i don't know because i never believed in that but that's what came up in my reading my ancestors reading so i might be working with those kind of entities at, at some point then they, he breaks down the cipher. He breaks down the cipherists and he talk about the archangels uh, of the uh, cipher. Kether is the planet Uranus and Metatron is over that order. And he goes on to go, he goes over each one and, and, and pins each cipher with a planet and let you know which angel is over each cipher or planet. So that's really, he goes into very, very deep detail about that. And then he talks about the elementary. Uh, spirits of this type are relatively easy to contact. If a magician has an understanding of the magical elements, they represent these intelligence are very specialized. And unlike planetary spirits who often possess many areas of knowledge, each elementary usually has only one area of expertise in which it is proficient. This may seem like a weakness, but actually elementaries perform assignments within their power so quickly and efficiently that most magicians do not mind the trouble of looking for the right one to conjure. Following are, are the powers of elementaries along the, the name of type. He talked about the earth, these gnomes, earth elementaries can help magician acquire riches, materials, and other better jobs and promotion. They are excellent teachers. So these things are actually uh, true. You know, after we talked about fairies and all that stuff, uh, then he talks about sylphs. 
which is associated with the air. Sifts are excellent teachers and initiators. They can help a magician learn almost anything by teaching him or her a unique way of studying because they deal with the mind. Air, mind. That represents consciousness uh, travel, you know, at the speed of light. So it is, it is connected to air. It's just that fast. And so uh, they can help you study. Then he talks about the salamanders are connected with fire. And you want to be careful working with these uh, fire, because uh, you see that too in Voodoo, they have the the um, the cool water spirits, the cool spirits, and then they had the fiery spirits in Voodoo. So you want to be very careful when you're working with fire, uh, these fire energy, because it it it, it can it it'll leave some aggression behind if you work with those fire en energies too much. Beings of fire kingdom can show an evoker how to control the energy and vitality of the element to bring about change in the world, from protecting the magician to giving him or her the power to accomplish what needs to be done. These beings are extremely helpful. They can also teach the magician and how to manipulate actual heat. Heat and flame, which is an awe-inspiring power. And these, the water spirits. And that's the one my friend have seen. And those are common to see in the water, the undines. These gentle spirits can help magician with relationships of all kinds and can help him or her solve all kinds of discord among loved ones. Undines can bring great peace to a household and are some of the friendliest spirits a magician will ever encounter. And unfortunately, they possess such a great beauty, many magicians become infatuated with them. They're so beauty, uh, they're mesmerizing when you come in contact with them. You know, rem remember, no matter how attractive and Tyson a spirit may be, it is still just that a spirit. Try to limit the amount of contact you have with particular undines until you have mastered control, uh, mastered the art of control of the invocation, okay? And then he talks about the demonic spirits. You know, uh, he says these are the hardest types of beings to control. So because they are by nature antagonistic to the magician, the last thing they want to do is help an agent of light perform a task. Even though they could be con commanded to do so, the chances of receiving false information and reap results are increased when working with demons. My advice is to avoid working with them in the first place. He doesn't talk about them, but he, talk, he do, talks about the goetic uh, spirits, which is iffy to some people. But when I got to looking at the goetic spirits, you know, really what they were about, um, I didn't see anything wrong with them. They look more indigenous. When looking at the goetic spirit, to me, they look like they are the ancient spirits. They have more of an ancient background to me. And and they just lost touch with their full potential and meaning. And that's just my perspective. But it, you could see something different from me when you get the book, when you look at the book. Some people feel the spirits listed in the Goetia should be considered demons, see? But I have my reasons for disagreeing. Throughout history, the gods of one group of people would always become the demons of their conquerors, see? And because I've seen some Egyptian deities in there too. When you see some of these pictures of some of these deities, they almost look African or indigenous. And that's why they've been demonized like that, all right? And I talked about that too in one of my other videos when I talked about demons, all right? So... You can go back and watch that video if you want to. This seems to occur in the Goetia. One of one of the spirits, Astaroth, is actually a thinly disguised god form of the Mesopotamian goddess Astaroth. See? While some of these entities do seem a little on the evil side at first glance, practice shows that many of them perform useful tasks such as healings and teach a great number of useful things such as languages and sciences. They are easy to command and personal experience has shown me that the goetic entities are far from demonic in nature. So you see that too, some of the Egyptian deities, they're like have half, uh, you know, animal and half human bodies, but they're, you know, not bad deities. So he, he's letting you know why they could be categorized like that because of political reasons. Okay. 
And then he talks about God forms. These are beings of incredible power, should only be evoked under the most extreme circumstances. One of the safest ways to work with these energy sources is to invoke rather than evoke. See, some of these things, you know, that's why I said these are two different things. So make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. As an invocation, an assumption of God form only allows one to come in contact with the reasonable amount of his power and influence. Dependent on his or her magical development, a magician will only be able to call in as much God form energy as he or she can control. However, trying to externally summon a force like that of the Egyptian gods and goddesses, for example, example is difficult and could be dangerous. So you want to be careful. Okay, people want to be careful. However, trying to, okay, okay, so I read that part. And uh, he says, for this reason, evocation of God forms would be dealt with in this book. And like I said, he thoroughly goes over everything. He don't just educate you on, on something, just throw you in there. He gives you safeguards too. You're going to be learning the lesser banner, banishing uh, ritual uh He's going to teach you all that. This is high magic and it it takes dedication. It takes commitment. So make sure this is something that you're ready to do. All right. Uh, and he talks about the Olympic spirits, the Arb Arbitel mat of magic. A medieval grimmery introduced the entities as the rulers of the 196 Olympic, Olympic provinces. The energies they rule correspond to the seven magical planets. And therefore, and this sounds like uh, the Orishas right here. You know, this sounds like the Orishas I promised to do, seven magical planets. And therefore, these beings are very similar to other planetary intelligence. Some differences between the two do exist. However, in many of the Olympian enti entities are more useful than most planetary ones. This is not widely known because the most important attributes of the entities found in the Arbitel are hidden behind the allegorical description of each. That's interesting. For example, when alchemy and philosopher's stone are mentioned, the author of the Grimmery is really talking about the personal alchemy. If magician wishes to enter the path of high magic, then his or her goal should be perfection and adepthood. Personal alchemy is not the changing of the lead to the goal, but trans transformation of oneself into a more spiritual being. I told you that's what it's all about. Doing that, that, that shadow work, doing that inner work. The more you do that, the more you're going to be able to control the things around you. All right, doing that inner work because that's what it's going to take to control the energies of the universe around you. But I digress, I digress. Uh, let me go on. The assistance of these beings provide in this in this task very powerful. It's very powerful. And for this reason, each Olympic spirit is described in great detail in chapter 9. And then he talks about... Uh, this includes, I mean, what is this? Arch typical images. I wanted to go on. Oh, and I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I'm done with this um, book review. And then he goes on to, oh, no, did I want to go? Oh, no, I wanted to go on to 31. 31, and then I'll let you guys go. 31 is when, you know, he, he this was the part I got to. Because when the first step in the first session of this, you are really going to be like learning some stuff. Like he comes right out and start just jumps in there and start teaching you stuff. Before attempting evocation or any other type of magical practice, one's mental faculties must be conditioned and trained. After all, the human mind is the most powerful implement in any occult practice. And once the magician masters its abilities, he or she can perform any magical task with ease. This chapter contains exercises designed to help develop magical senses and abilities in in an individual, you will find them in the order in which they should be performed. What magical senses have, have to be developed? The most important ones are the ability to see and hear astrally. Mastering these faculties ensures success in evoking spirits 
and communicating with them. The importance of their development cannot be overstated. While it's true that obtaining these abilities is easier for some than others, it's not an impossible process. Anyone could train his or her astral senses through steady practice and application of the following training methods. One of the most discouraging things about trying to develop magical abilities is the lack of immediate perceivable results. Many occult training systems present this a problem to the novice. As a result, many students give up. I look into the consideration I have put together the following exercises. Instead of showing how to train the magical senses for repetitive and tiresome exercises, Again, you know, I'm working with this electronic book, you guys. Instead of showing him how to train magic, magical, okay, wait a minute. Instead of showing the train the magical sense with pre pre protect, repetitive and tiresome exercises, you will find how to develop these senses through practice of other magical te techniques, which will grant the training magician observable results. For example, and it, it showed me for the, on the first exercise, like sitting in that chair and going into that, I think that was in the first e exercise. Hey, and then he talks about ringing the bell too, where you he teach you how to shift it, shift that astral realm to the physical realm with just using sound. You know that's that's as that enables that helps you be able to hear on the astral sound. That's how he opens up your astral uh, ears. Like I said, this book is phenomenal. Uh, let's see, step by step explanation of how to scry or crystal gaze. I didn't learn that. The reader will know, and I think he does that with a black mirror. Be careful with the black mirror, too, you guys. You have to be careful with that. For example, the reader will know right away if he or she is obtaining results, and you will. And at the same time, we'll learn additional valuable magical techniques. Both astral senses, sight and hearing, should be developed at the same time. For this reason, I have grouped the training exercises into sets that should be performed together. I urge you to keep a magical diary of your progress. Sometimes certain astrological influences or the phases of the moon can affect your workings. If you have a diary, you can go back and identify these patterns. Also, since an accurate recording of every evocation should be made to ensure there is no loss of valuable information, keeping a diary at this point will help develop this important habit. Okay, so I hope this uh, video was useful to you. I was going to go on to 47, but it's already too long. I, and, and you have the book anyway, so you'll be able to see this stuff for yourself. This is an awesome book. So read with care. All right. Thank you for being here with me today. Light and love.